ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to speak in front of the developers of uh, CUDA and uh, GPU computing. We benefited a lot ourselves from this technology, and I'm very glad to tell you the story. Uh, it all began, uh, as you just heard from David Lutke, in 2006, when uh, through uh, David Kirk and uh, Wen Mei Wu, a colleague of mine, uh, well known in this uh, community at the University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign, uh, introduced me and my co-workers to GPU computing, particularly NVIDIA GPUs and CUDA. Uh, we uh, uh, worked quickly and hard, and in 2007 we published our first methods paper, a paper today already highly cited, and uh, in the subsequent years, until now, we published quite a few studies of scientific, that led to scientific discoveries that actually used uh, GPU computing. So my lecture today is not on potential and on methodology, but rather on documented use of GPUs. Uh, when we uh, realized the potential of GPUs, we uh, decided early on that we want to make three uses of this potential. The first was that we actually wanted to increase the accuracy of our simulations. The second natural was that we wanted to speed up simulations to make uh, calcul calculating uh, biological systems a little bit more convenient or possible because of the speed gain. And of course, lastly, we also wanted to open new doors to new fields in order to tackle problems that were not possible before because computing took too long. To give you a little bit of a feeling for what we actually do, I will use uh, the swine flu epidemic as an example. You see on the left side um, uh, the protein tummy flu. What we do is, instead of uh, simulating new airplanes, we simulate uh, little proteins. The reason that we need to do that is that these proteins are so small that they cannot be seen at the detail necessary and with a motion that is essential in uh, normal experimental methodologies. And so computing has to complement those experiments. And as you see here, uh, you see this little molecule floating in front of, uh, of the protein, that's actually Tamiflu. And uh, at the uh, high point of the swine threatening swine flu epidemic, it was realized that uh, the virus had become resistant against Tamiflu. Tamiflu was designed by pharmacologists to plug a hole, a key hole in this protein this hole was needed uh, by the virus uh, to actually do a synthetic chemical step, or to rather cleave a bond in order to, to produce itself. And uh, so it was clear that uh, the virus couldn't do anything to that hole where tummy flu bound. How could then the virus become resistant against tummy flu? And what the movie shows is that tummy flu is not binding in one step to this hole, but rather in two steps. And that, that additional step is actually the one where the virus uh, realized it can fend off the Tamiflu drug. And uh, knowing that, of course, pharmacologists can now design drugs that do a one-step rather than a two-step binding. Now, the main message here is actually not so much the detail, but rather that you realize that what the computer is doing in the life sciences and medicine is it provides microscopic views that are not available otherwise. And so uh, uh, that is actually uh, what we do. And uh, here you see that we are able to view with this uh, new microscope, which I like to call the computational microscope, small systems in living cells, nanosystems. We need to see those because those are the scales that cannot be seen with other methodologies and that are relevant 
for pharmacological interventions and also for the basic understanding of life. You see on the right side a living cell and uh, this cell is uh, uh, has many parts and I will talk about uh, six processes in this cell. One is how proteins are made, then how proteins are folding, how um, the, the cell controls its genes, <coughs> how the cell solves its energy problem, how the cell conducts chemistry, and uh, last but not least, uh, how the cell is uh, infected uh, by a virus. Our microscope is not made of uh, brass tubes and glass lenses. Our microscope is made of scientific knowledge, of mathematical algorithms, of software and hardware. Let me explain. Uh, we begin with the science of chemistry. Chemistry tells us that the atoms that make uh, living systems are mainly oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, but they are just not the same, all the same carbons, all the same oxygens. For example, oxygen in water is different as oxygen in alcohol, as you may appreciate. And, um, and so chemistry tells us what kind of atoms we find that are, that are defined through the chemical bonds, and it tells us also what kind of forces these atoms exert on each other, for example, in chemical bonds or between chemical bonds. So we can uh, de deduce the forces from chemistry, and physics tells us then how these forces made the atoms move. That's a famous uh, uh, law of Newton that you see written down there, often amended actually through modern statistical mechanics in case we want to control temperature of our sample or control temperature and pressure and so on. Mathematics tells us then how we compute the interactions, the forces, and uh, how we compute the motion. And uh, as you probably remember from high school or actually in your daily life uh, as a programmer, um, there are smart ways of computing things and there are not so smart ways. But what is smart depends actually on uh, what computer platform you have. And that definition changed uh, tremendously uh, when we went from uh, CPUs to GPUs. We were very fortunate that we had tinkered a lot in the past with all kinds of algorithms. Some of them disappeared in our drawers because they were not really that good for CPUs, but they looked pretty and interesting to us, and so we kept them around. And we were very, very lucky that when the GPUs became available, it was exactly those algorithms in the drawers that helped us very, very quickly to make good use of the, of, uh, the GPUs. The program that puts all, everything together to bring it to the hardware, the hardware is our program NEMDI. Uh, this program is very popular in the community. It has uh, over 40,000 registered users and it runs well on many platforms, on, on many processors and cores. As you see there in the little graph for different systems, for different platforms. And so uh, that is one part, maybe the brass tube part, of our microscope. The, the glass lens part is a part that uh, permits us to actually look at our uh, sample. <laughs> and uh, this is uh, uh, organized and done by our program VMD that's even more popular in the community. It has 140,000 registered users. And um, the lenses that we develop permit us to see electrons move as you see on the right bottom, it sees us uh, the atoms move and shaping the, uh, the form of a molecule. Uh, it's, it uh, helps us to see how molecules actually go about their function, like the lipoprotein you see there, so-called high density lipoprotein, or also good cholesterol when you go to the doctor's office. That's uh, cleaning our arteries from cholesterol. And last but not least, you see on the right top uh, a view of the entire cell containing over 300 ribosomes. And uh, all these views can be had in one data set and one session of VMD. 
So we can go through this cell on the top right, move along until we see some ribosome that uh, interests us. You see that on the top right there. And we zoom in and we can zoom so much into detail that at the end we actually see every electron 